Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV. We're also today, as always, on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, both of our TV stations on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We're also on the radio on 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff service of the Bloomfield Hills School District, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community. Radio that out of Avondale High School with leadership from station manager Marty Schaefer and technical engineer Keith Fraley. We appreciate having them on with us each and every day on our family of TV and radio stations all throughout the Oakland County area. Today we're also on Facebook Live from the West Bloomfield School District's Facebook page and appreciate them joining us today as they have many times before here on the Oakland County Megacast where we go over all the latest news and information about the coronavirus and other top stories in the local area in, in West Bloomfield, Kegel Harbor, Orchard Lake, Sylvan Lake on Civic Center TV and Lakes FM, on Birmingham, Erie Municipal Access on Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin, and in Auburn Hills, Pontiac, and other surrounding areas in northern Oakland County on WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Making news today, as always, on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. We have all your top stories for the day, as well as links to reputable sources of information on the coronavirus and from your municipalities. And our top story today, Michigan and four other states announced that they are suing the U.S. Department of Education and the Secretary Betsy DeVos over virus relief funds for schools. The Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel announced that California and three other states alongside Michigan announced that they are suing Represent, uh, they are suing Secretary Betsy DeVos in her, for attempting to take pandemic relief funds away from K-12 public schools and divert some of those funds to private institutions. The lawsuit names Education Secretary Betsy DeVos as the defendant. California Attorney General Xavier Becerra says, quote, Today's announcement is about stopping the Trump administration's latest efforts to steal from working families and give it to the very privileged. Yesterday, we held the press conference with Dana Nessel and Governor Gretchen Whitmer, along with the state superintendent, uh, Dr. Price, who talked extensively about how these funds were being di were potentially being diverted based on the U.S. Secre Department of uh, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos's interpretation of the Federal CARES Act. And it seems like what what they're claiming is happening is that Secretary DeVos is directing that these funds not only go to K-12 institutions as they are, but also go to, go to private institutions based on their number of students as well, as opposed to the CARES Act, which uh, as opposed to the claim from, in this case, uh, the, f the five state coalition that the CARES Act says it goes to public schools based on all of their students and then to private schools based on their share of how many low income students they have among their student body. You know what's so disappointing in all of this? At the end of the day, this is about kids. Yes. And we need to reach our kids and we need to make sure they're getting the best education. So when we have adults put politics in between, you wonder how many kids are being hurt by all of this. This pandemic has thrown all of us for a loop. And I could not imagine being a parent trying to educate my child in this, whether they go to public, private, charter, at the end of the day, it's a kid trying to learn. And we need to do what's best for the kids. A absolutely, and, and this COVID-19 funding is supposed to be going to, towards that, toward aiding these schools and recovering from what they have experienced during the pandemic, and also being able to prepare themselves financially and, and just from an infrastructure standpoint for going forward uh, as the pandemic continues on. Uh, and they prepare for what may be a, a, a tumultuous fall as well. Other news at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, $100 million in critical COVID-19 relief may be coming to Michigan small businesses. Small businesses in Michigan with fewer than 50 employees will soon be able to apply for a share of $100 million in grants. The Michigan Strategic Fund Board voted yesterday to dedicate a portion of the state's funding from the Federal CARES Act uh, and president of, Mi of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, Mark Burton, says, quote, the funding is so critical to our state's e economic well-being. 
we see that there's a need out there, and closed quote. President of the Small Business Association of Michigan and former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly says, quote, the move comes at a really important time. The financial suffering among the smallest of businesses is really severe. And Ronnie, as a lot of these small businesses have restarted their operations and are back to some semblance of normalcy as much as is human possi humanly possible during uh, the times that we're in, there's still a lot of relief needed and any help that they can get, they're absolutely going to want to take. Well, when we're talking about small businesses, you have to remember, too, that maybe they're only working at 50 percent of the capacity. You can you have to limit how many people come into your business. And on top of that, uh, your sales, I would imagine, are less as well. So you're still trying to recover. I really think when we started all of this, remember back in the beginning, I think they were first saying, oh, two weeks. And now we're several months into this, and it looks like this could go through the end of the year. We need these businesses to survive so that we have businesses coming out of this pandemic. And let's hope that this does come to an end and we can get back to how things used to operate. But we need these businesses here. We absolutely do. And these businesses, not only are they drivers to the state economy, but you think about it also, this is a lot of the, these are a lot of the businesses that if they're doing well, they're going to be hiring people. And a lot of our unemployed are going to be able to go back to work in some capacity uh, working at, at these jobs. And, on top, and the people that they have laid off will be able to come back to work uh, eventually as this pandemic, hopefully sooner than later, comes to an end. So any relief that, that these small businesses can get, it, it's going to be absolutely crucial to them going forward. Other headlines, Michigan's newest headache, young adults are driving coronavirus growth. Michigan residents under 40 years old are now making up over half of all of the new COVID-19 cases in recent weeks. The spokeswoman for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Lynn Sufton, says, quote, we saw it. Tables being pulled together, people standing in line, not social distancing or wearing masks. Young people are doing what young people do, eating and drinking and losing inhibitions, and closed quote. It marks a dramatic shift to who's testing positive now as the fastest growing segment of co new COVID-19 cases continues to be in the age group of of 20 to 29 years old. We saw that on the onset, at, of course, Harper's in East Lansing and, and at other bars in the Oakland County area as well. And now this is really becoming a problem area. New cases are, are coming up. We're not seeing as many hospitalizations as we've spoken to Dr. Russell Faust and other medical officials about uh, from these younger people because their immune systems are maybe a little more apt to deal with it or they're not getting as severe symptoms that put them in the hospital. And we're seeing that now People that are in the age group of 20 to 29 are really getting infected at a higher rate than ever before. I would imagine, too, after the 4th of July weekend and the video we saw from the one beach and the one sandbar, anyone that was in this area, the Cass Lake sandbar is extremely busy and popular as well. So it would be interesting to see if that number and that age group continues to grow, but it's not so much that you're worried about them, you're worried about the family members that they could give it to. You, you are, and especially with the, high, I mean, previously, the highest common population of people that were getting this virus were, were older people, were, elder, were more elder residents in, in the state of Michigan and all throughout the country, and they're at greater risk of getting the disease. And when younger people are picking it up and they're asymptomatic or they're not severely symptomatic and they're carelessly going around to, to different places in public and not following those guidelines, they're able to spread the virus, it seems, a lot easier and, and I have it really affect them, but it still deeply affects a lot of other people and creates a dangerous situation. And that leads to our next story. Governor Whitmer recently said Michigan could, quote, dial back, and closed quote, reopening if COVID-19 cases continue to rise. Governor Gretchen Whitmer spoke with CNN on Tuesday morning and said that the state could dial back reopening of cases if, if COVID-19 continues to trend up in new cases. Whitmer said, quote, if they keep moving up, we are going to dial back if we have to. That's the last thing any of us wants, and closed quote. Governor Whitmer recently ordered indoor service at bars to close, and while most of the state remains in phase four of the Michigan Safe Start Plan, northern reg regions of Michigan have been in phase five, and Governor Whitmer says she will not be bullied into moving up a phase before it is absolutely safe. 
to do so. And so these new caseloads that are coming in, especially the uptick in younger and younger people getting COVID-19 and not having as severe of symptoms and being more apt to spread the disease without it really affecting them. Governor Whitmer expressing again, she's going to be extremely cautious in moving the state forward so that we don't end up like many other states in the union that are seeing severe spikes in cases. The one thing I, w I would be interested in knowing about this is how is she determining that? Because even Senator Gary Peters said, well, we're going to have more numbers because we're testing more. So what is the determining factor on that? So if that, that seems logical, right? We're testing a lot more people, so the numbers are going to be much higher. So at what point in time do we take that into consideration or, or are they doing that on a daily basis and putting it into percentage for the previous test as well? Yeah, you, you look at that and you think, well, maybe it's going to be based on things we see out in the community. You know, we see these large gatherings uh, and someone tests positive. You wait two more weeks and then you con and then the contact tracing leads to m maybe more cases and you see those spikes. Maybe if there's more deaths in the hospital, there are more hospitalizations in total alongside these cases and those start trending up again. Maybe at that point you see Governor Whitmer begin to, to take those precautions and, and consider moving back. Who, who really knows right now that there hasn't exactly been a whole lot of specifics on that from the governor's office. Michigan reports 454 new cases of COVID-19 and 30 deaths as the death total now, now tops 6,000. Michigan passed the sobering mark of 6,000 deaths from COVID-19 on Tuesday this week. And the state reported 454 new cases and 30 additional deaths from the coronavirus. There are about 1,100 more active cases this week than there were last week, with a total of 7,100. It should also be noted that 20 out of the 30 additional deaths were identified during a records review. Therefore, there were only 10 new deaths over the past 24 hours. The total number of Michigan residents who have COVID-19 is now at 66,627, with a total of six of 6,005 total deaths in the state of Michigan. So numbers continuing to trend upward. Again, we go back to those, those expanded testing numbers that are going to lead to ultimately more positive cases. We're also seeing a bit of an uptick in deaths. Yesterday it was in single digits. The day before it was one of the first days, it was the first day since March with zero deaths. Now we have this 10 new deaths out of those 30, uh, out of those 30 that were reported, 20 of those being from uh, previous records reviews. So we're seeing a bit of an uptick in, in, de in deaths and in cases per day. That may be a, a point of caution going forward, but still early stages of this mini spike, let's call it, in the state of Michigan. I will say the one good thing about this, when you're looking nationally, we are not having the same experience right now that states such as Florida or Arizona are going through. While our numbers are remaining steady and going down compared to where we were in March and April, that does say that Michigan seems to be going in the right direction and people are paying attention and most of the people are, you know, following the, the rules and the regulations to try to, if not stop this, at least bring it to somewhat of a manageable, manageable level, which is what we need it to be at. That we do, Ronnie. And for more information on how these tests are being expanded and being more con convenient for the community and, and where maybe we go with the research of COVID-19 to understand these spikes better, we're now joined by Dr. Laura Lamb from the Beaumont Research Institute on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Lamb, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So how are you? How's your team at the Research Institute? We are doing uh, very well, thank you very much, and working very hard. So for those who are unfamiliar, what research in, in normal times and now during the pandemic does the Beaumont research team conduct? So we have a wonderful team of researchers here that span everything from basic science all the way to clinical and um, in between. Um, so we have people that do bone research, we have people that do cancer research, um, neurology, Alzheimer's disease, um, and our group uh, most of the time works on um, bladder disorders actually. Dr. Laura Lamb with us from the Beaumont Research Institute. Your team recently developed a COVID-19 test that delivers pretty rapid results. Give us some details about how that test is conducted and how speedy those results are. 
Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, our normal day job is actually developing diagnostic tests for other diseases. And so we're very excited that we were able to use our past experience um, and start developing a test for coronavirus back in uh, late January when it was starting to uh, become a global concern. Um, so the way our test works is you take your sample, whether it's a, a sample from a nasal swab or uh, spit saliva. Um, it can work in other body fluids if the virus is present, but the respiratory tract seems to be where the virus is present most, so that's the samples that we focused on. And you mix it in um, a test tube with um, some molecular reagents, heat it above 100 degrees for um, 30 to 45 minutes, and at the end of that time frame, if the sample contains virus, um, it will glow under a UV lamp, whereas if um, there's no detectable virus present, there won't be any um, glowing at the end of the, uh, under the UV light. So it's a relatively simple test. It's relatively quick and um, all the reagents are very inexpensive. And importantly, it doesn't require any expensive uh, medical equipment or machinery in order to run. Dr. Laura Lambeth with us from the Beaumont Research Institute on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Lambeth, this new test, was it developed based on previous COVID-19 tests? Was this a completely new concept? How is this specific test that's so, so uh, delivering such quick results developed? Yeah, so this is actually based off of our previous research um, developed for detection of Zika virus. So going back a couple years ago, um, when Zika was in, um, in the, the news lines, uh, we developed this technique um, that was previously available uh, called RT Lamp. And um, it allowed us to detect Zika virus in urine um, and serum of uh, patients that were uh, at risk of having infection. Um, so that original process actually took several years to go through the whole process of development. And so because we had that experience back in January when we decided to start developing um, a test to detect uh, coronavirus, we took that process that took us originally several years and we were able to do it over several months. So it just shows you every time you do research, you're learning, you're expanding, you're building. And so it, it, when you go through the process, you can do it a lot faster. I would like to emphasize that this isn't FDA approved yet. This isn't something you can go to the clinic yet. This is research, um, but we're hopeful that in the future that we can bring this to patients. So Do Dr. Lamb, on that note, the, the results from this test can come in as quick as 45 minutes. Just a few months ago, we were talking about several days, maybe even weeks before you would be able to get the results of your coronavirus test. And this just seems to be so rapid in comparison to that. How has the testing developed over time to allow for speedy tests like this that just a few months ago we didn't think really would be possible? Yes, so that's that's a wonderful question. And again, it goes to back to research that was actually done in the early um, 2000s and just really improving on the reagents that are available and uh, a wonderful shout out to the larger scientific and medical communities. When this, this has really been um, an unprecedented sharing of knowledge. So when those the virus first emerged in China, um, scientists and, and were sequencing the virus, finding out the uh, RNA sequence for it on the nucleotide level, and then sharing that freely with the global community of scientists and, and physicians. And so because there was that really early sharing freely available to the world, um, we were able to, to start developing this test before it, before we got our first case in Michigan, to be honest. Dr. Laura Lamb with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is from the Beaumont Research Institute. Dr. Lamb, uh, what sort of challenges did you and your coworkers in the development of this test face? Um, so so um, there's always uh, financial support is always a concern of ours um, when developing things. They obviously none of these things are necessarily inexpensive. Um, luckily, we had some uh, flange P that we could base this off of. Um, and then um, one of the other uh, early challenges was uh, as I mentioned, we worked on this in January before there, there was really cases within the United States. And so we didn't have 
um, clinical samples to initially uh, test this test on. And so what we um, were doing was we were taking kind of uh, a, a fake virus, but it wasn't a virus, it was just uh, something that resembled it and adding it into samples. So that was kind of our initial proof of concept that it did work if the sequence was there in the um, in the reaction in the sample. And so then when we started getting um, cases in Michigan, um, we were very fortunate that our wonderful reference lab here was able to provide us with some um, samples that we could actually validate our test on. So with that, we've been able to test it now on clinical samples um, that are from people that have the, the um, coronavirus and validate that it is a very sensitive test. Dr. Lamb, I think just like the general public, we've all become so educated on the coronavirus since this pandemic began, and I've been obsessed about watching some of the shows about the difference in the various coronaviruses. We, the world kind of went through this before, I think it was like the swine flu and the bird flu that were variations of this. So how did that tend to go away and how could this relate to that? <laughs> so you're right that we this is not uh, coronavirus refers to actually a family of viruses that are related. It's not necessarily a specific strand, although in the public we use it to refer to the strain that's out there right now. Um, that being said, um, yeah, so MERS, SARS, um, all of those are coronaviruses that had caused um, uh, concern before and they went away. And actually, um, there's several coronaviruses that cause the common cold. And so um, if you have a very severe common cold, they might actually test you for those other coronaviruses. Um, I am not a virologist. As I mentioned before, uh, I usually develop diagnostic tests for bladder disorders. And so um, for me to speculate on why this virus compared to those other related viruses has the staying power, that's not really my area of expertise. Um, but obviously this is here to stay. And so um, as you guys mentioned wonderfully earlier in your program, um, taking a, appropriate precautions um, for reducing your risk is gonna be critical within the next um, year or so until a vaccine is widely available. Testing is so important to get people back to work and the economy, uh, you know, going again. So I think one of the things people are having an issue with is so many of these tests are not reliable. We're getting false results. How will this test be different? And what would you say to those employers as well until something does come out that is more reliable? So, yeah, this is this is not your normal day um, a disease that we study in terms of how easy it is to test for. Um, and so trying to develop improved diagnostics is something so many researchers um, are working on. So I assure you the research community is working very, very hard on addressing these uh, concerns. Um, we compared our test to the gold standard, which is called PCR testing. So that's the test that you typically have to wait a day or two to receive your results back for because it's at the end of the day, it's very sensitive um, and it's the most reliable testing option out there currently. And so um, that's what we compared our test to. We had about 95% agreement with the tests that were positive by that test. They were also positive uh, by our method. Um, and then the, the results that were um, uh, negative by the gold standard, we have about 90% agreement using our method. Um, and that might be because either our test um, there was some contamination issue or it's possible that um, uh, we have some sensitivity, enhanced sensitivity using our method. Um, that will be the point of figuring out with more research. But yeah, we want to be very careful with um, any claims about uh, sensitivity. We want to make sure that we're thoroughly validating any tests. Um, and as I said before, to to the employers that are struggling to reopen your businesses, we are we are working very, very hard to help support you in that endeavor because um, we are a part of this community. This is gonna be a community effort and um, we're, we're, we're there to support you. We're doing our best. 
Dr. Laura Lamb with us from the Beaumont Research Institute on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Lamb, what are the next steps for this type of, of test and, and how can it be made available for expanded COVID-19 testing in the future or be available to the public? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we do not have FDA approval at this point. It's not available to the public. So our next steps are to start to um, bridge that gap, right? So um, get our test ready for FDA approval. Um, right now, the FDA has emergency use authorization or EAU approval for diagnostic tests for coronavirus. So that means the process is um, a lot faster to go through. Um, and then obviously, working with manufacturing and, and, and developing something that would be end user friendly because all of our testing has been in a laboratory setting, but at the end of the day, you need to make it so it's user friendly. Dr. Lamb, anything else you'd like to touch on before we let you go today? Um, thank you very much for having me here and um, thank you for the work that you're doing, um, sharing information uh, about this disease and, and bringing it to people's awareness. Thank you. We appreciate having you on. Dr. Laura Lamb from the Beaumont Research Institute with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a quick break and we'll return with more. You are listening and watching to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations all throughout the local area. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly, and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl on our family of TV and radio stations, including Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH The Biff, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, bringing you the latest information about the coronavirus pandemic and other top news stories in Oakland County and the immediate surrounding areas. Uh, talking about research uh, earlier on in the show today with Dr. Laura Lamb about new testing that's coming out that could be available here soon and get your results in 45 minutes. Really impressive stuff. And then industries have also been reopening over the past several, several weeks and the past couple of months in the state of Michigan. That's definitely had an impact on the travel and tourism industry as we enter into the thick of the summer months. And joining us now to talk about that is the Vice President of Travel Michigan for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation is David Lorenz with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Mr. Lorenz, thank you for being with us again. A pleasure. Good to be with you as well. Good morning. How are you? How's your team at Travel Michigan doing? Well, we're getting by. Uh, as you know, uh, you might remember that uh, we are operating without promotional budget right now. So this has been a strange year for us at uh, Travel Michigan in so many ways. Interestingly, uh, the, you know, enough, um, you know, if we even had promotional dollars, we probably wouldn't have spent them in the way that we uh, typically would have. Uh, this year. So 
it's just a, such a strange year uh, to try to help the tourism industry. So we've been really focusing in on efforts to try to encourage the industry to use all the appropriate protocols and guidelines to make sure that they can keep people as safe as possible, to keep their operations as clean as possible, uh, so that we can, uh, in other ways, welcome people to travel Michigan in a safe manner. So it's been a, a really interesting year, and I know it's been a strange year for everybody. Let's cross our fingers, we can get through this uh, quicker than maybe um, many of us fear it will take. Dave Lorenz with us, the Vice President of Travel Michigan for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So, so Dave, a lot of industries have reopened since we last had you on. There's a lot of, a lot of those lockdowns on, on traveling and on lodging and on camping ha have been either either been lifted or have been lightened in some way. How is the tourism industry in our state recovering now that, that things are opening back up and people are maybe venturing out a little bit more? Yeah, I was able to uh, check uh, some of the uh, northern Michigan uh, tourism industry properties uh, about a week and a half ago. I uh, went up to the upper Michigan, uh, upper peninsula, and uh, met with many of the tourism industry uh, business owners, uh, kind of did a review on how their um, adjusting for the new norm. I was really impressed, by the way. Everybody's taking the cleanliness issues very, uh, you know, uh, seriously. Uh, Mackinac Island is doing a great job. The rest of the Upper Peninsula, I, I visited numerous communities in central and eastern UP. I was so impressed. The, the challenge, of course, is that part of keeping everybody safe as possible uh, is that uh, we need to reduce occupancy levels. You just simply can't have as many people as you would typically want to have uh, in, in places like restaurants and hotels and attractions and such. Um, so that is, um, you know, intentionally kind of slowing down uh, the industry this year to try to keep everybody safe. Uh, we've already started uh, opening up uh, later and we haven't been able to open up still everything that people would like to uh, utilize uh, for travel. So it's it's continuing to be a rough year. We've lost many businesses, I'm sorry to say, uh, businesses that simply won't be able to come back. Many restaurants, you know, retail and restaurant is a big part of travel and um, they've been hit so, so very hard. Uh, some of our, even of our attractions like museums and, and uh, amusement parks and sports facilities still really aren't operating. Uh, so it's been a tough year. I think that we're going to be lucky if we can get to about the 50% um, level than, than what we were used to. We've been every year for the last five years or so beating every other previous year record. Uh, the Pure Michigan campaign has done a great job to encourage people to travel. The industry has done a tremendous job to provide the what I call the Pure Michigan experience. Um, and so this has been a big shock to everybody in every way, and the travel industry is, is not alone in that. But we've been, I think, hardest hit as an industry. More than half of our uh, workers uh, were put out of work, were either furloughed or permanently laid off. Um, we're going through kind of that second stage of layoffs now where uh, many of our industry members that were furloughed uh, in hopes of being able to come back, well, now they're being laid off permanently because their operations haven't been allowed to come back to full operation or because they just simply you know, couldn't afford to keep their employees. So it's, it's a rough year. Um, this year, it's all about survival. We'll look to thrive another day, but survive is the, the word we're trying to use right now. And that's why I've been trying to encourage people in Michigan to see travel in Michigan as kind of a patriotic call of duty this year. Uh, I don't think people should be going from state to state right now anyway. We're not outwardly encouraging people to come into the state from other places like we normally would do. And that's such a hard thing for me to say because that's what I'm normally encouraging to do because I think it's so healthy for us in normal times. So this, this year, I'm hoping that people stay in the state that they visit other places in the state. They, they check out our, our wonderful attractions and beautiful destinations and, and, and kind of, um, you know, learn again what a beautiful place we happen to live in and, and better appreciate Michigan for all that we have to offer. So, Dave, you're mentioning that there's all these great attractions to go to and that, and that you're encouraging people to go out and, and explore the state of Michigan, at, especially in those places that maybe the economic resurgence from things reopening isn't as strong. What are some examples of some of those places that you have seen people going so far and maybe lessons that the industries in those areas can serve for 
industries and, and tourism in other areas of Michigan to learn from going forward? Yeah, well, I started uh, like a week and a half ago, as I mentioned, I was in the Upper Peninsula because that was the first place to, to mostly open under the governor's latest orders. And, um, and I have to tell you, um, it's interesting. You know, typically this is our really busy time, right? So as I uh, visited places like Fayette Historic State Park and uh, places like um, we went over to the uh, Island Resort Casino over by Escanaba. We uh, were in the Munising area and checked out the Picture Rocks boat cruises and how they're operating. We were in Marquette, uh, checked out a really beautiful private campground and checked out a retailer, Getz's, which is a really famous Upper Peninsula retailer. Uh, they sell a lot of uh, like uh, outdoor gear, um, just really cool place. And then we were in Sault Ste. Marie. We checked out how they're uh, encouraging people still to come down to the locks and watch the ships go by, but you can't go into that uh, big, beautiful uh, display uh, viewing uh, platform because of it's shut down right now to keep everybody safe. We went to the, um, the Valley Camp Museum, which is a, a big ship, which is turned into a museum and it's really awesome. Uh, and so in every one of these cases, everybody was doing the right thing. I was really impressed. Um, when we were on Mackinac Island, uh, we went to, on the Shepler's Ferry. They are doing everything, as, I, as they always do. They're, I think they are among the very best when it comes to hospitality in the state. Everybody looks to them as leaders in hospitality. They have kind of that, that Disney approach, and they're really good at it. So they've, they've taken everything uh, into consideration, encouraging, in fact, requiring masks on the boat. They're, they're keeping people distanced. They're, they're, they're uh, adding more boat uh, operations like every 15 minutes right now, which is pretty awesome. Uh, that, that provides an opportunity for fewer people on the boat and, and then providing masks if people don't have masks. They're cleaning between every, every cruise between the island and the mainland, so it's pretty awesome. And then you get to Mackinac Island, you have all those people crushing together, of course, initially on the docks. So they're encouraging people to socially distance as much as possible, wearing masks in those really busy places, even when out of doors. And then went indoors uh, to wear masks. I, I will tell you that the very first place I went to about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, was Mackinac Island. And um, I was displeased, disappointed, that there were so many people who were simply refusing to wear a mask. They Once they got on the island, they said, I'm outside, I'm not going to wear a mask. Well, what they were refusing to, to understand is that it doesn't matter whether you're indoors or outdoors. When you're shoulder to shoulder with somebody, you should be wearing a mask to keep everybody else safe. Even if you're not concerned about your own safety, uh, you never know if you're carrying it. You might be asymptomatic and you don't want to spread out. I mean, anybody in their right mind doesn't want to take a chance to get somebody else sick, right? Well, it's hard to get that across to some people, especially people who think this is a political thing rather than a simple, simple health uh, uh, protocol that you can you can take it's still very simple to do it's no big incursion in your life and then when you're you know out away from people biking around the island or whatever you're doing well take off the mask you know no big deal so mostly good um but there were a few disappointments like that from people who were just not understanding it yet but that was early on and i can tell you even the next week when i went to the rest of the up um, I saw that attitude changing dramatically. And I think just in the last few weeks, people have started to understand that this is not a political thing um, and they're, they're starting to get it. So I've been encouraged to see that. Your point about the economic impact though, really does need to be mentioned that um, we can't allow these little inconveniences to get away, uh, to get in the way of us enjoying ourselves uh, for our own, you know, for our own well-being and for our family's well-being, but also for the economic well-being of this state. I mean, we need to travel right now. Maybe there'll be one good thing that comes out of this, this horrible situation we're in. Maybe people will better appreciate this beautiful state that we live in. I happen to travel all over the world to promote travel and tourism. I don't get to really enjoy places I go to very often because I'm going from meeting to meeting or whatever, but I see them. Uh, I don't you have a lot of free time when I go to places, but I see these places. And I'll tell you, every time I come back, I think how lucky I am to live here, how lucky I am that I happen to grow up here and I'm still allowed to work here, being able to do what I do. So I'm hoping that now that we're gonna be able to get back to travel again, and now that we are traveling again, that people 
understand the value of travel and tourism and appreciate our lifestyle to a greater degree, more so than ever before. And I think that's going to happen. Uh, David Lorenz with us, the Vice President of Travel Michigan for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Uh, David, Canada recently extended its closure of the U.S. border through July 21st. A recent survey also showed that a majority of Canadians are in favor of continuing that closure going forward as the U.S. continues to see spikes in COVID-19 cases in various states, including some in, here in the state of Michigan. For areas like Port Huron and other tourist locations, how does the closure of the Canadian border impact the tourism industry? Industry in Michigan. Well, Detroit as well. Of course, Sault Ste. Marie, Port Huron, and Detroit. Detroit is the busiest international crossing in the world. So you have to realize that first um, with the bridge and the tunnel. Another bridge coming down the way one of these days. Um, and Detroit being our number one tourist attraction destination in the state. Um, it's, it's a big hit for us not to have those Canadian travelers who love Michigan. I mean, we have so many similarities, but our values, the prices here are so, uh, so less. I mean, there are people who typically will travel across the Port Huron Bridge just to go to Meyer, for instance, or Sault Ste. Marie, same thing, because everything's so much cheaper here in Michigan. It's getting, getting gas. It's worth crossing the border for them. Um, so uh, we're missing out on those, what, two and a half million um, overseas travelers a year, and uh, a lot more Canadians come across normally and spend money when they're here, and they have a great deal of fun. And you know, um, it's it's a big it's a big hit to us. Uh, I'm really disappointed to see that um, that extended. I was just as disappointed to see the Canadian government, in effect, um, uh, make the cruising industry disappear this year because they're not allowing uh, cruise ships to come in the Canadian side of the, the water. Well, it's not, it's not viable for uh, our cruise operators to, to, um, to come just into the U.S. side. It's too difficult. So there goes the cruising business for this year as well. And they had a really great plan to, to handle that. So that's all, you know, um, water under the bridge. So it's the way it is. And we'll have to adjust um, here's the good thing, though, because there's, you know, there's always something good to, to bad. Yes. Um, it's not as busy as it normally is. So as you do get out and you go to these places and you do the things you love to do and you experience these uh, beautiful places and friendly people around the state, you're going to be with less people. You're already going to have a better chance to socially distance. Um, we have been promoting for a few years what we call our Meanwhile in Michigan program. And uh, this was a, a, a campaign that most people in Michigan probably never heard or saw because we were getting into markets like Chicago and Minneapolis and Indianapolis and Columbus and such. And we were saying, listen, we know how busy it is in your towns and how crazy the traffic is. And so we had billboards up in these really busy, you know, um, areas where people would just be stuck in traffic and they would see all this traffic in front of them and then up on the billboard it would see this beautiful picture of, of a small town in Michigan it would say you know here you are right now in traffic but meanwhile in Michigan you have this beautiful small little town you can visit that doesn't have a lot of people not a lot of traffic you're gonna be able to enjoy yourself and you're gonna be able to breathe the fresh air you're gonna be able to enjoy uh, our beautiful little towns so um, when and if we are funded again to market Pure Michigan, and I'm absolutely sure we will soon, and we're going to be able to do it at the right time, saying the right messaging to travel safely, um, we're going to try to get that message out to people both in state and other places eventually to say, listen, here's the truth of the matter. We happen to have a beautiful four season environment here in Michigan. We don't appreciate enough. But one thing that we should realize, as we're all looking to kind of get to places without tons of people around, we have a lot of really cool places to visit. And, and I'm not talking just about the very popular places like Traverse City and Mackinac Island. We have little towns all over the place. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I quite often drive around the state and um, often I go for business and I think, man, I want to come back here just to explore these places. Like the Sauk Trail between basically Detroit and Chicago, that, that 12 route. Yeah. It's a, an ancient a route. It was used by animals and Native Americans and, and uh, the wagon trail people. And, and now it's uh, this nice little route you can take from little town to little town. You know, all of them, you know, kind of uh, still have that late 1800s look. It's really cool if you like that type of architecture, which I do. 
Um, and so that's just an example of the things you can do and see without a mazillion people around you and, um, and not necessarily places maybe you thought about before that I'm hoping people will think about and go to because they're going to find that friendly, welcoming, safe, clean environment there as well. David Lorenz with us, the Vice President for Travel Michigan for the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Dave, RV and camper sales have been going up recently. We've, we've seen that happen. Uh, it's kind of coincided with the state parks reopening and camping being permitted once again. Other than those reasons or on top of those reasons, what are some of the, what are some of the reasons why RV and camper sales, rentals, uh, buys, leases, and so on are going up in the state of Michigan? Yeah, they've been actually uh, increasing for years. Um, when the gas prices started to kind of become reasonable, or when we started to get used to the new gas prices, the uh, RV sales, the big RV sales started to, to increase. You know, the, the cool thing about Michigan's Department of Natural Resources, they're very innovative. So they do a lot of really neat things to make uh, camping easier for people. One of the things they started doing a couple of years ago was um, finding places in the state where you could just leave your RV up there for the season so you didn't have to bring it back and forth if you had a trailer. Um, so they're always looking for those types of um, offers uh, to provide people. The thing is, you can go to a state campground in Michigan. It doesn't cost much, especially if you get the state passport. What is it, 13, 12 bucks, whatever it is. And then you can go to a campground and then, you know, the daily cost to be there. It's a really, um, you know, affordable way to travel. Um, my wife and I, um, you know, we still like to tent camp here and there. But I have to tell you, man, RVs, they're, they're so comfortable. It's like, you know, carrying a hotel around in your, you know, behind your car. Um, it's just a really comfortable way to get into nature. Most people don't have an opportunity to get outside uh, very often. And uh, so it gives them that, that connection with nature again, even though they might be relatively close to the next camper. They're still far enough to wait right now to socially distance, uh, to get away from the big crowds and to enjoy that part uh, that makes Michigan so very unique. And we have millions of acres of forest. We have 11,000 inland lakes. We touch on four of the five Great Lakes. You're never more than five miles away from a, a lake or a stream. That's pretty awesome. And the thing is, when you're camping, you really, you really understand that to a greater degree. You can hear all those stats and all those figures and you can say, okay, like everywhere else, right? Well, it's not like everywhere else. I mean, we are really blessed to live here. And, and the fact that we can, we can just kind of pack up at night and go just a short distance away and find a little park to go to, that's a pretty awesome experience that can't be enjoyed by many people in this world. We get to do that any day we want. And uh, the fact is most people don't realize how unique that is. Dave, if a family is not so much the outside type, they still like the conveniences of being in a hotel room, what changes can they expect in hotel rooms? Are they still open? Are they discounted? And if the hotels are open, are the amenities available still as well? Yeah, good, good point. Not as many amenities, simply because they, they've done all the things that we've asked them to do um, to make sure that, that uh, people stay as um, safe as possible, that their environment is as clean as possible. So these are some of the things you can expect, and I've been seeing as I've been exploring the state. Uh, your very first um, entry into the hotel, you're gonna notice that there'll be plexiglass in front of the registration desk. Uh, might be a little bit difficult to hear them, so just kind of, you know, Keep, keep attention, you can't read their lips because they're gonna be wearing a face mask. And I hope you will be as well when you come in. Um, many of the hotels are gonna to find uh, touchless ways even to register, especially the big chain hotels where you can, you can register online. And then of course you can even check in online. So you can just show them your phone app and, and scan quite literally often right through the plexiglass window. It's really technically savvy uh, hotels will be doing that. The smaller mom and pops are not gonna be able to do that, but they're gonna do everything they can uh, to keep you safe. You're gonna see these hand sanitizer stations everywhere. They're gonna ask you when you go to a, an elevator to have basically uh, typically about maximum of four people on the elevator unless you're with a, you're with a party with more. And if you're with your traveling party, you, you know, use all of them in an uh, elevator, of course, because um, you've been traveling closely together. They're gonna ask you to, to stay, you know, six feet apart from the other guests and everybody's gonna be kind of halting for a second. It's strange because you don't want to be rude, right? You, you used to 
welcoming people and looking them in the eye. And now you're kind of looking at them as, okay, how can I stay away from them? It's just a, a kind of a weird thing, but you get used to it after a while. When you get to your room, uh, you'll get in there, you're gonna see a fewer things uh, in the room that you might typically see. It's, it's uh, many places will give you a packet when you register. It might be in like a Ziploc bag. It might include your little coffee packets and soaps and shampoos and whatever, because those will likely not just be hanging in the hotel room like they typically would. Uh, you'll probably not see glasses and cups, ceramic cups or whatever like you might see. You'll probably uh, see plastic cups in plastic bags, one use type, um, and then you'll throw them away afterward. For people like me who like to recycle, it's get a little difficult because um, you're gonna, you know, just have to uh, deal with this temporarily. And literally, what I do is I carry my own soap, I carry my own uh, cups and all that stuff because I just can't stand throwing things away. And when I check when I check in, uh, I just say well, I've got that settled. I don't need any of that. Carry my own coffee even, uh, typically. And then um, in the room itself, uh, some some hotels won't even have um, telephones in the room. Uh, you're going to find, you know, less of those touch point things. Um, they will, um, many of them will even show you like your TV remote, um, how it's been sanitized already, probably a little sign in there telling you all the things they've done to, to keep you as safe and clean as possible. Um, and once you get used to it, it's no big deal. Um, and then uh, uh, some hotels, for instance, I, I was at a Best Western the other day and um, they typically would have their little buffet in the morning. It's a good deal, uh, but they can't do buffets right now. So they had a little bagged breakfast with a water bottle and apple and a muffin and a granola bar or whatever it was. And then they, they had them all you know, ready to go, stickered clothes so people couldn't just be poking through there and leaving the bag. Uh, they thought about everything. So I felt very safe, very comfortable, as comfortable as ever. And um, oh, the other thing, if you're staying multiple nights, unless you request it, they likely will not be cleaning your room while you're staying there. I'm happy with that because I always feel it's kind of a waste to, for somebody else to make my bed. I'm fine with that. So um, those are some of the things you'll notice. Um, many places are offering discounts because um, they want to get your business. Uh, others are are already kind of at their their um, minimized capacity, so they probably won't be offering discounts. But the fact is, we offer great deals in Michigan anyway. So um, go out there and enjoy yourself. David Lorenz with us, the Vice President of Travel Michigan for the Economic Development Corporation. Just a couple more minutes with you before we got to let you go. So what's your forecast going forward for the travel and tourism industry? You mentioned that it's been a very, a very tough year for, for, the, for our industry in Michigan so far, that the summer is absolutely critical to the general year. You've mentioned it before that this summer is absolutely critical going forward. So what is your forecast for the remainder of the summer, for the fall during the foliage months and into the holidays? Well, fall will be the new summer to a great degree. Uh, people are gonna be traveling later into the year, especially if schools don't reopen. I know the plan right now is mostly to have schools reopen on schedule, but um, it depends on whether that happens or not. But if schools do not open on schedule, you're gonna see more people traveling into the fall with their full families and using that travel experience as an educational opportunity fully into that, by the way. We should be doing that all the time. When we used to travel with our son when he was small, um, we, we try to use travel as an educational opportunity everywhere we went. Uh, and I think everybody else should as well. So that's gonna be kind of the new, new way to travel, I think, with families is, is using as education as well. But this summer, I'm thinking that, uh, I can tell you from the experience I had going into the UP and to Mackinac the last couple of weeks, <laughs> I was really surprised to see all those people out there. A lot of cars on the road, a lot of people are traveling. And even though we have not been promoting out of state uh, or even in state really that much, uh, I saw a lot of plates from uh, Missouri, Iowa, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, of course, Wisconsin, um, Texas. We always do well with Texas. A lot of people will drive up here from Texas and spend the summer because they just can't stand it down there. It's way too hot. Hard to believe as hot as it is here. Yeah. It's stifling down there. So um, that's going to continue. I think where earlier, uh, about a month and a half ago, I was thinking we'd be happy to get about 45% of our volume, even without international this year, which is a big hit to us, about a billion dollars in spending. Uh, we typically do about $26 billion in spending and 
a lot of travelers. I think we'll probably do about 55% of what we typically would do for the summer. Now, this hit at our slowest time. So we weren't as badly hit as some states like Florida and Alabama and whatever. Um, so they're gonna be in worse shape than us. Um, but I, I'm thinking right now 55%. If I keep on seeing the type of travel I've been seeing out there in the last couple of weeks, I might be a little more positive uh, later on in the summer. I hope I am. Well, David Lorenz, thank you very much for being with us today. Remember, your trip begins at Michigan.org. Yeah, that it does. Thank you very much. David Lorenz, the Vice President of Travel Michigan for the Econ Michigan Economic Development Corporation. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about con a continued issue about funding for our schools. That's next on the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations all throughout the local area on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, both of those channels on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We're also today on the West Bloomfield School District's Facebook page via Facebook Live. Each and every day we have a Facebook partner. We thank the West Bloomfield School District for joining us today and allowing us to share our program and share all the local news for today today with thousands of people all throughout the local area. We're also joined, we're also pleased to be joined by a number of other local community radio stations, including WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. That is 89.5 WAHS Auburn Hills. WBFH, the Biff, is also joining us. That is 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills, out of the Bloomfield Hills School District. And, of course, our flagship station, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, 89.3 Lakes FM. Live streaming online 24 hours a day, seven days a week on lakesfm.com. And we are pleased to be joined now by West Bloomfield School District's Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Deanna Barish, now joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. Deanna, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me again. It's good, it's good to be on again. Good to have you back. How are you? How's your learning team at the district doing? We're doing well. It's uh, it's going to be a very busy summer. Not much break at all, actually, but we're, we're all hanging in there and uh, getting excited about thinking about what August might look like for all of us. So the governor and her Return to Learn Council recently unveiled the Michigan or MI Safe Schools plan and called it a roadmap. Your district was the first in the local area to release their plans for the fall semester before any other uh, really in the state. How will the roadmap provided by the state impact the plans that were already in place in West Bloomfield or maybe modify them, if at all? So we were really pleased to see her roadmap 
uh, because it does really align with, with exactly what we were thinking and planning this spring as we started to contemplate a variety of scenarios that we would have to make sure that we could we could uh, do for our students and for our families. And so while there's certainly some uh, different nuances to it, there's a little more flexibility probably than what we thought there might be. It actually aligns very well with what we already have planned and we've been thinking about. And so it does a great job, the plan does, really outlining a, a number of items like student safety, staff safety, cleaning. Um, so not just the instructional piece and that attendance piece, but certainly how are we going to make sure that students and staff are safe to return. Is the West Bloomfield School District ready in the case that the governor has to move us back into phase three or that we go into phase five or somehow, some way are in phase six and are clear of this by the fall, ready to make those sudden changes and say, okay, we're doing away with this part and that part of the plan and this is how the district's going to operate? Yeah, you know, really, Tyler, that's exactly what we're doing. And so we've actually taken her plan, the governor's task force plan, and aligned our plan to it. And so what we will be sharing with our Board of Education uh, during a study session Monday evening is really line by line and then phase by phase exactly what that will look like as best we can right now at, for the West Bloomfield School District. So when it talks about masks or it talks about a hybrid instructional model or it talks about fully remote, what do all of those things look like within the West Bloomfield School District? And we'll be sharing that with our staff and our families in the next in the coming weeks as well, because we feel like we need to be fully transparent um, so parents can make the best decisions they can for their kids. There are so many changes and so many moving parts to this. What is the best way or how do you think it's going to be the best to try to get this information out to all of the families? Because like I said, there's so many different areas to this. If I have a kid in the second grade and one in the eighth grade, their needs are not the same. Yeah, you're exactly right. So we have a couple of things planned. Um, the first is we hosted a, um, we're starting Lakers Online, which is our fully online remote option for the fall. And yesterday we hosted two prospective student webinars for parents and, and for prospective students. And we had over 500 families that attended. Um, each of the sessions. So we had a really good turnout last night and certainly there's some interest from our community um, and remaining online only. Next week, we're actually gonna seek some feedback from our families about the, those issues exactly. What a need is in second grade is not necessarily what parents are concerned about in, in an eighth grade or with a senior. And so we are gonna provide two opportunities for some focus group conversation, limited to 60 parents per level. So 60 elementary parents, 60 high schoolers and middle school parents. So we can get some feedback and some of their concerns that we can begin to address. So that's Monday and there'll be more information going out today to our families about that. And then finally, on the week of, of July the 20th, um, we're going to have two additional webinar opportunities for parents where we will be talking specifically about what our phase plans will be in West Bloomfield School District. You know, the, the biggest challenge is right now, today, we're in phase four. And so we are planning for phase four instruction. What might be at the case in two weeks could be phase three. Um, I don't necessarily believe we'll be in phase five by the time school starts, but that I guess is certainly possible. So what we have to do is plan for every possible scenario. And we wanna make sure that parents know that we're following exactly what the governor says and that if they were in phase four, then that's what we're planning for. And if we move to phase three, meaning we'll go fully remote, then that's exactly what we'll do as well. And so I think it's making sure that we're transparent and give parents ample opportunity to participate in the discussion, have their voices heard, and then certainly be a part of the conversation when we've made those decisions. Deanna Barish with us, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction for the West Bloomfield School District. So Deanna, the Laker Online program provides of course, the, onla the online learning and distance learning capabilities for students going forward. Um, a lot of school districts are providing options for all in-person, all virtual, or take the hybrid option. Are those options available in the West Bloomfield School District? And a lot of those also have deadlines, as we spoke with uh, Bloomfield Hills Superintendent Pat Watson earlier this week about in their district, when are parents and families uh, going to have to have those decisions to the school district by? Sure. So we're going to host our parent meeting, like I, I just said, on July the 21st. So please stay tuned for more information about how to tune in for that. Um, we are asking parents to commit to Lakers Online by Monday, July the 27th. And, uh, you know, no differently than all of our neighboring districts, 
We have staffing decisions that have to be made. We need to make sure that we have um, technology in place so students can access those online courses right away. Well, there's just a number of factors that we have to consider. We have not taken any option off the table. Um, it is, it is you know, a challenge to really think about coming back five days a week with full classes. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that that, that really is, is very challenging um, to do and socially distance, to be able to provide masks and make sure that kids are safe, to make sure that our staff is safe. And so we're continuing to study all of those models. And so as of today on July the 8th, we have not made any final determination about what our, our, our plans will be for the fall. Certainly there will be in-person instruction as long as we are still open at that point in time. What exactly that will look like, um, we're, not, we're not exactly sure. And that's why we're seeking the, the feedback of our staff and our families before we, we talk about what those finalized plans will be. On top of announcing the Michigan Safe Schools Plan roadmap uh, at, the, at her press conference, Governor Whitmer also spoke on a uh, bipartisan agreement between the governor's office and leaders in the Michigan State Legislature to provide federal CARES Act dollars uh, in their state budget, over $500 million, so schools in the state of Michigan. How will those funds be received by West Bloomfield School District, and what will, th will that extra money coming in be put to use for? Well, there's, there are a lot of things to consider around safety, quite frankly, and so uh, uh, most of those dollars have already been, um, the previous dollars that we were allocated a few months ago have been used for things like technology needs, whether those were Wi-Fi hotspots, additional Chromebooks, um, things like um, we might have purchased some, some software for students to be able to use, things like that. But honestly, as we look at our next wave of funding, we really have to consider student and staff, staff safety. So that's making sure that we have um, masks in place for, for staff and for students, that we have the collect cleaning, cleaning protocols in place and the ability to do that as thoroughly as what those plans require. And so a lot of it really is about that those safety things. So it isn't necessarily that we're gonna have dollar, extra dollars to spend on, on um, things that we really would like to spend them on, necessarily books or things like that, but really it's just making sure we can open our doors safely for our community. Some districts are worried about a teacher shortage going into the fall. Is that a concern for your district? And would you need additional teachers, some to teach in the classrooms and some to teach remotely? Well, we always are concerned about teacher shortages, particularly in those high, um, high areas, so special education, math, physics, those sorts of courses that are really are specialized. And so that's always a concern for us. Um, I know, I, I'm sure that we, while we've not necessarily seen that in West Bloomfield, we know that there are teachers across the country who are, are considering their, their career options at this point in time because it is so taxing to, to be in education right now and to have all these unknowns and not sure what it's going to look like or how safe it's going to be to return. And so we also are aware we're working very closely with our Education Association leadership to make sure that we uh, have a good joint plan in place and that our staff can return safely. So yes, we're, we're obviously worried about how many teachers will want to come back and feel comfortable coming back. Many have um, either compromised uh, uh, systems themselves or have someone in their home that might be, that might prohibit them from coming back. As far as Lakers Online and that remote learning option, we believe that because these are current students who will be moving from our, our in-person instruction into our, our virtual um, online option, that we'll be able to shift staff to be able to take care of that without any issue. But certainly staffing is always a challenge. And so that's part of the reason for that early deadline, that July 27th deadline, is that we have enough time to identify teachers, make sure that they get the professional development they need in order to be able to teach remotely for, for a school year, and then be able to start our first day of school is Wednesday, August 26th. So we're on a very tight time frame to make all of this happen. Deanna Barish with us. She is the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction in the West Bloomfield School District. And, and I'm just thinking about in the fall, Deanna, when uh, you do have partial in-person learning and partial non-in-person non learning. You have people, partic particularly at the middle school and the high school level, where they're switching between classes, and they're in the hallways between these classes, and you're trying to maintain social distancing and enforce mask wearing. How is that going to work, even with a reduced uh, population of students there in the facilities at a given time to make sure that we're not having groups of people that are clumping together in, in their groups of friends and having conversations and that kids that, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable for them to wear, to wear masks like anybody else, but make sure that they are wearing masks and maintaining social distance. 
uh, it's a challenge. Uh, you, you named all those things that are, are really keeping us up at night, quite frankly, because um, we're, we're social creatures and kids are particularly social. And so while they are better about wearing masks and understand the need to, and many families are doing an excellent job reinforcing that at home, um, we know that kids like to be close together. They're gonna be excited to see their friends. They haven't been together since March the 12th. Um, and so we know that we're really gonna have to, to be very careful in how we have students move through the hallways, how we limit the amount of kids that are in a particular area at a time. For instance, we won't eat in the cafeteria. Um, food will actually be delivered to the classroom. So kids will have to eat in their classrooms. We're going to try to keep kids in very small pods so that really it's the staff who's traveling to them rather than the kids necessarily moving through the hall. And we know that that's difficult. We'll have to talk about staggered um, bell times so that if they do need to move from class period to class period that not everybody is out um, doing those things. We've really been at the forefront of this. We asked each of our buildings to establish a classroom to cloud, which is our framework um, leadership team comprised of parents and teachers, paraeducators, secretaries, building leadership, to begin to think about how this is really going to work at each of our buildings. And what might work at one elementary might not work at another. What might work at Orchard Lake Middle School that's gonna have far fewer students this year may not be the same as at Abbott. And certainly when we look at West Bloomfield High School, which is where I'm located today, and thinking about 1800 students returning in the fall, their needs are significantly different than, than an elementary school. So we have teams that are meeting every single week as building teams. And then we have a larger district classroom to cloud planning team that meets um, uh, every two weeks. And so we're aligning our plans around district protocols, around masks and safety and hand washing and how we're going to enter from buses. But certainly there are some nuances that happen in each of our buildings as well. And so it is a challenge. I mean, it, we would we'd be crazy to say, oh, we have it figured out. We have all of our answers. It's good to go. And, and we, we're ready to, to start. We have good plans in place. We have a good framework, but there's still a, a lot of unknowns and certainly work to be done. Deanna, yesterday the governor and the attorney general, Dana Nessel, announced that the state is joining four others in the union in a lawsuit against U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos, claiming that the department is attempting to reroute CARES Act funding from public schools to private learning institutions. Your thoughts on the DeVos interpretation of the CARES Act relief and, and if the money is to be deferred away from public schools in some effect or in major effect to private institutions, how would that affect school districts like West Bloomfield? and those that are in maybe lower uh, lower income situations and less fortunate areas. Right. Uh, well, you know, that uh, it's a very touchy subject, of course, but, you know, we, when you, I believe, this is my opinion, um, when parents make decisions about sending their kids to private school, uh, whether that's a, 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 public, a private, you know, parochial school or just a, a typical private school or a charter school, you're making that decision and, and then, in my opinion, assuming the costs that go along with that. Even in, in crisis situations like that, you've made the decision that private school is the best option for your family. And so therefore there are certainly costs that are unexpected um, that you have to be responsible for as parents who are sending their kids to private school. And it is a detriment to, to our school district um, to, the, to the tune of, of several thousand dollars that would be shifted away from us that would directly impact our residents and our kids who attend West Bloomfield School District. And so it, it is a challenge. We understand and, I, and certainly want all kids to be safe and we want them to have what they need. But we also recognize that our needs are very different than, than some other places. And so anytime we don't get the amount of funding that has been allocated to us, it certainly has a detrimental effect. Deanna Barish with us, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction in the West Bloomfield School District. Deanna, before we let you go, anything else uh, about what's upcoming in the school district, about the fall learning plan uh, or otherwise, that you'd like to touch on before we say goodbye today? Other than I would just thank you for having me and for always keeping us uh, in the loop and letting us share our story. It's been uh, a, certainly a trying spring, and I assume it's yes. going to continue to be in the fall as well. Um, but I really appreciate the fact that you, you let us talk about where we are in our planning. To our families in West Bluefield, we ask that you continue to check our website really every single day. And we are sending out messages via text about where we are in our planning giving you opportunity to weigh in, giving you opportunity to listen and to, to be a part of the decision-making process. And so please engage. When we send those probably sometimes um, many, many emails or text messages about what's happening in the district, 
please make sure you're reading them and then reaching out if you have questions. One of the worst things that can happen is someone not feeling like they've been heard or that we're not answering questions. So please feel free to reach out to me um, or to anyone on our staff to be able to get those questions answered. Well, Deanna, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. As always, Deanna Barish from the West Bloomfield School District, their assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a brief a brief break, and when we'll come back, we'll go over today's top headlines and talk with more interesting guests from around the Oakland County community. I'm Tyler Keeft, alongside Ronnie Dahl. The Oakland County Megacast returns after this. Hello, I'm Dr. Betty Chu, Chief Quality Officer at Henry Ford Health System, and I'm with Wright Lassiter, Henry Ford Health System's CEO, to talk about coronavirus. In uncertain times, it's natural to have questions, so I'm going to ask Dr. Chu to answer some of the common ones. First, why can't I visit my grandma to see if she's okay? Because the elderly are at a higher risk for complications with this disease, and you could inadvertently infect her. If I'm healthy, why can't I go out with my friends? The larger the crowd you're exposed to, the higher the chance you could get infected and infect others. If I have symptoms, why do I have to seek care? While the disease isn't dangerous for most people, for others it can be. We need to understand how serious your case is because the right choices save lives. For more information, visit henryford.com or call 313-874-1055. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hello, I'm Dr. Faust, Medical Director for the Oakland County Health Division. Coronavirus Disease 2019, or COVID-19, is a new disease caused by a new respiratory virus named SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 was first identified in December 2019. There is currently no vaccine to prevent coronavirus disease 2019. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before eating, and after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using a regular household cleaning spray or wipe. Avoid close contact with people who are sick and avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and throw the tissue in the trash. Finally, stay home when you're sick. For more information about coronavirus disease 2019, go to oakgov.com slash health or call 1-800-848-5533. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, our flagship stations. We're also joined by other community television and radio stations throughout the local area, including Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin. Also on 88.1 WBFH, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District under the leadership of Station Manager Ron Winnables and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio out of Auburn Hills, located at Avondale High School. We thank them for joining us today, as they do on each and every one of our programs here on the Oakland County Megacast. Today, also we are broadcasting on Facebook as we do each and every day, and today our Facebook partner is the West Bloomfield School District. So uh, go ahead and go to their page and Give them a like, like our video, and go ahead and like our Facebook page as well when you're at it, Civic Center TV on Facebook. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl making our top headlines today. Michigan and four other states are suing the Department of Education and Betsy DeVos, their secretary, over relief funding from the virus uh, being diverted from public schools to possibly private schools. The claim is that is that the Department of Education is going to be 
is attempting to move relief funds away from K through 12 public schools and divert that money to private schools instead. The lawsuit names Education Secretary Betsy DeVos as a defendant. California's Attorney General Xavier Becerra said, quote, today's announcement is, is about stopping the Trump administration's latest efforts to steal from working families and give it to the very privileged. Yesterday here on Lakes FM and on Civic Center TV, we had the governor's press conference alongside Attorney General Dana Nessel, and they had some choice words on why they joined, the state is joining in on that multi-state lawsuit. We must fight for every single dollar available for education. And that's why today, Michigan is partnering with California to lead a coalition of states in the filing of a federal lawsuit against Secretary DeVos and against the Department of Education. Now, in our six-count complaint, we asked the court uh, to declare DeVos's rule and guidance unlawful and that they be vacated and the Department of Education be enjoined from enforcing it. Michigan kids simply cannot afford for Betsy DeVos to play politics with their education and that's why I am committed to using all of the resources at my disposal to fight for and on behalf of our students, teachers, and schools. Governor Gretchen Whitmer also had some words about how, about particularly how this plan would impact public schools in favor of private schools. Governor Whitmer yesterday at her press conference alongside Attorney General Dana Nessel. Betsy DeVos and the Trump administration have a different plan. Under their new rule, private schools in affluent districts may receive services that Congress intended for disadvantaged students. This isn't how it should work. This is a virus that has had a disproportionate impact on low-income communities and communities of color. Schools in these areas deserve a government that will support them throughout this crisis. The DeVos rule strips dollars away from schools in need of that critical funding. She doesn't share our priorities for protecting and improving public education. And that's why this action today is necessary and we're grateful for the Attorney General's leadership. Michigan, of course, joining four other states, including California, in that lawsuit against Governor Whitmer. Some very strong words, Ronnie, from our state leadership against U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. And this, in, in her department's interpretation of relief aid for schools in the Federal CARES Act. I think politics is getting in the way of this ed in education. Kids matter, and we need to put them front and center and put politics aside. This is such a crazy time. I could not imagine being an educator right now and trying to figure all of this out. I think, again, everyone thought this was going to be over by the time we went back to the fall. It's not going to be. So everyone is trying to do their best and say, hey, how can we make this work? How can we get our kids what they need to be able to continue their education? And that involves kids you know, all the way up through college as well. College campuses are struggling with this issue as well. Funding is a big thing. A lot of the kids, or quite a few kids, I think we did the story uh, yesterday or earlier this week, where financial aid requests are down. More kids are doing gap years, perhaps, deciding to take this, this year off. So this is impacting kids from the you know, earliest years all the way through college and post-graduate schools as well. And education is going to be so critical in the future to our society in preventing the next pandemic and in creating new innovations that will help us through crises like this or, or on lesser levels even or greater levels even that we're not imagining later on in time. So being able to provide for these kids and understanding that providing education is providing education uh, while also taking into account still on the side of the governor and the attorney general that certain districts and cert certain students are in a better position to battle through this from an educational standpoint than others, ultimately we're still educating our kids and we have to keep that first and foremost and, and put the politics aside to, to get the job done, frankly. And keep in mind that when this happened at the end of the school year last year, a lot of businesses closed down so their parents were home. Going into the fall with more businesses and companies back online, parents may not be able to stay home with their kids to be able to educate them remotely. So that is going to be a new factor that needs to be looked at as well.
there are a lot of different things to be considered in educating our kids going forward and in a lot of under, other industries that need to be considered as well. More headlines on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Good news for small businesses. $100 million in critical COVID-19 relief may be coming to them very soon. Small businesses in Michigan with fewer than 50 employees will soon get an opportunity to apply for a share of $100 million in grants. The Michigan Strategic Fund Board voted yesterday to, de to dedicate a portion of the state's funding from the Federal CARES Act and the president of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, Mark Burton, says, quote, the funding is so critical to our state's economic well-being. We see that there's a need out there, and close quote. The president of the Small Business Association of Michigan, Brian Kelly, also said, quote, the move comes at a really important time. The financial suffering amongst, among the smallest of businesses is really severe. So, in the, so stay tuned. In the coming weeks, we may be seeing some serious uh, relief aid available to small businesses in the state of Michigan. Uh, Michigan unemployment officials are revealing a staggering number of residents that are still waiting for their unemployment benefits. Over 38,000 resident filings, residents filings are still being held up due to the identity theft issues uh, from the unemployment insurance agency in the state of Michigan and over 200,000 people are being held up due to non-monetary issues. Since mid-March, the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency has seen over 2.4 million claimants for unemployment benefits and have paid out about $15 billion and more than 97% of those who have filed have received at least one payment. Many are asking why unemployment insurance offices have remained closed as these cases continue to amount. I remember before the 4th of July, there was a, uh, there was a goal set by the UIA to cover backlogged cases from March through, May, through the end of the month of May, and it still looks like a lot of cases out there are, are not having the needle moved forward, which is going to be causing even more economic hurt to a lot of families and a lot of people uh, in the state of Michigan. I think one of the most frustrating parts for the people trying to get their benefits is they're unable to reach anyone on their phone, they can't go into an office, and they're stuck in this limbo area of government red tape and they can't get a resolution. And in the meantime, life is going on, your bills are piling up, and you're still in this battle to try to get your unemployment. And here you are also facing the potential that in the next coming months, maybe the governor isn't able to continue to extend the, uh, to extend relief on rent and, and, um, and extend the moratorium on evictions. And now you're facing down that, you really need these funds. And if you're not able to get a single paycheck that you're owed, the back pay coming to you too little too late is still frankly too late. One thing we'd like to let people know is when we had some of the, our elected leaders on, they are working with some of the constituents that have been unable to get those resolutions through the unemployment agency itself. Remember your elected leaders are here to try to help you as well. So if you're hitting a roadblock in that area, be sure to reach out to your elected leader in your area and your district to try to get some relief from that down that path. Our state senators and our state representatives ha have definitely been expressing their frustrations with what's been going on with the UIA as they and their teams are also working consistently around the clock to help unemployed residents try to receive their benefits or at least some sort of c communication and that is and that is leadership on both sides of the aisle that does not cross that does cross party lines back and forth. Here are the official Centers for Disease Control Guidelines for Youth Sports Safety during the pandemic. The CDC has posted its advice for, safe, for safely resuming youth sports amid the coronavirus pandemic. This includes physical contact like fist bumps and hugs being avoided and focusing on individual skills and limiting full contact between players to only being on game days. The CDC recommends that staff, coaches, and parents wear their facial coverings and, and players should have their own equipment. Each sport will present its own unique set of challenges, however, and for more information on that, you can click on the article on our website on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. That's what's making headlines online. We update that each and every day, and we'll continue to bring you the latest news about COVID-19 and other crises in the state of Michigan. We'll take a brief break. and we'll, we'll, When we return, we'll have our next guest on the program and talk about more pertinent topics regarding COVID-19 and more. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, 
we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of our flagship station, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We are also on, on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and on 89.5 WAHS Avondale Community Radio as well. Also on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and on the Facebook page of the West Bloomfield School District, our Facebook partner for today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. And joining us now on the program is the Executive Director of Alliance Mobile Health, is Vince Warrius, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Vince, thank you for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. For those who are unfamiliar, what, what is Alliance Mobile Health? What services does it provide to communities in our local area? Alliance Mobile Health is a private EMS provider for seven cities in the Oakland County area. Uh, we provide emergency 911 response for various cities in the county. Uh, and we also do non-emergency transport work for patients that uh, require medical treatment, such as dialysis and uh, other medical procedures that are non-emergent. So, so during the course of the pandemic, our, our EMS workers in, in local fire departments and local municipalities, as well as the, the private ones like yours, have faced a certain number of challenges in dealing with COVID-19 and more. Among those, What are some of those challenges that your organization has faced and how have you overcome them? Well, obviously, uh, we're on the front line and we we respond to all calls. And one of the, one of the challenges that we have faced, obviously, is uh, protection of both of our staff as well as the patients that we serve and we respond to and treat. Uh, so making sure that uh, our units, our ambulances, our equipment are clean in between uh, every single patient, uh, protecting those patients from cross-contamination uh, as well as our staff that are on duty has been a challenge. Uh, and we've adopted several different new procedures to ensure that. And as a result, uh, we've had very good success with that. Uh, our units are sterilized every single day. Uh, they're, they're wiped down and disinfected in between every single patient. Uh, we're practicing different types of techniques to preserve the, uh, the, the health and well-being of our staff and other rescuers that arrive on scene. Uh, an example of that would be what we consider uh, the dirty medic, clean medic uh, process where only one of the individuals on the team will actually make physical contact with a patient. Uh, but we start the assessment process at the door from a distance. Uh, because a cough radius and sneeze radius can reach up to 12 feet. So we try to start that process as far away as we can and then work our way towards the patient. And eventually one will make contact and physically uh, work with the patient while the other one uh, provides a supporting role and stays as clean as possible to help any type of uh, contamination back and forth. So there's been a number of challenges that we've had to adopt and change uh, since the onset, but uh, we're doing very well uh, and uh, we have been successful in that process. Vince Warrior is with us, the Executive Director of Alliance Mobile Health on the Oakland County Megacast. So you provide EMS services for several municipalities around the local area, including the city of Troy, Michigan. And there's been an, an influx of need for emergency services during the COVID-19 pandemic between the virus and other issues that would be amounting anyways. Have you seen that your organization has had... Uh, has had a need for more business from municipalities, maybe that you don't serve normally or, or through greater partnerships because of the circumstances of our times? Um, yeah, yes and no. Uh, generally speaking, uh, during the peak of the pandemic that we experienced uh, March, April-ish, uh, even going into May, uh, there have been a few cities in the Oakland County area that had been uh, overwhelmed with call volume uh, requests for service and aid. Uh, and we work uh, very well with the Emergency Operations Center here at Oakland County, as well as all of our city partners. We've got mutual aid agreements with all the surrounding cities. So anytime somebody gets overwhelmed with call volume, 
Uh, they reach out to each other and uh, good neighbors as we are, uh, we always cross borders and we go into different areas as needed and help out. Uh, the city of Southfield, for example, experienced very high uh, call volume there for a while, and we actually donated and uh, staged a unit there 12 hours a day, seven days a week for uh, a couple weeks uh, until they could get through that peak period. Uh, but overall, generally speaking, there, there's been a decrease uh, in some call volume in some areas because of the fear factor that is uh, out there that uh, people are a little bit leery about going into some hospitals right now because they're fearful of coming down with it if they don't already have it. Uh, so there has been that factor, but we seem to be responding back to that now and things are getting a little bit back to normal from uh, that perspective. There's not as much fear there, I think. Has the recent spikes in COVID-19 cases been a cause for concern for you or for, for your staff in terms of continued safety going forward? Oh, absolutely. Um, there, there's there's no end to this just yet. Uh, we can't see a, a horizon yet where it doesn't exist. So um, there, there's been talk in many circles about this is the new norm and in many respects that's true. Uh, I guess you could kind of look at it as a wake up call that uh, we're entering a new age of PPE and preparedness levels, if you will, from our perspective that uh, we, we have to kind of assume that uh, every patient is infected until proven otherwise. Uh, so I think that uh, we're seeing a new norm here as far as the way we approach things and how we're gonna need to protect our patients as well as our staff moving forward. Vince, are you concerned about being able to get the required supplies going forward. I know things have kind of leveled off right now, but if the longer this continues, those uh, desperately needed PPP, PPE supplies, are you worried you won't be able to get them? There's always gonna be that fear because that's, that's a factor that's outside of our control. Uh, we don't manufacture them, we don't have that capability. So availability of those items is always gonna be of concern. But uh, like you said, things are starting to level off and supplies have uh, returned to a, a little bit more of a normal level. So we are capable of getting them and we have been stocking up on those to prepare for any additional outbreaks that uh, peak in numbers again so that we have them on hand. But what we also have been doing is we've been creative in our abilities to preserve some of that PPE, to reuse it, if you will. Uh, we've adopted some disinfecting techniques that uh, maintain the integrity of the equipment as well as allow us to clean them in between uses so that they're, uh, what used to be not reusable items are somewhat reusable now. But we do try to keep that to a minimum, but uh, we're utilizing uh, information and techniques that we've acquired from, uh, for example, Stanford University uh, and various other uh, research areas that have looked into ways of reusing and sterilizing this equipment without jeopardizing the integrity of its performance, if you will. So we're working with that and that has been uh, successful for us as well. So we're fairly confident that we'll be able to ride uh, anything out that comes in the future, uh, but at the same time, we're taking the steps necessary to prepare for that. Vince Warrior is with us. He's the executive director of Alliance Mobile Health on the Oakland County Megacast. We're in a bit of a heat wave here in southeastern Michigan over the last couple of weeks. And going forward, it looks like it's going to continue that way for a little while. Have you seen uh, an uptick in recent, in recent days in terms of overheating issues and heat-related illnesses uh, with people in the community? Oh, absolutely. Uh, anytime you get this type of a heat wave, you're going to see that. Um, the, the elderly population is particularly susceptible to that because as you age, you, your body's ability to maintain temperature and cool itself is, is reduced just as part of the natural aging process. So that tends to be the most susceptible population that we work with in that area. But yes, we are seeing some of that uh, and uh, it is of concern. So obviously, if you don't need to be outside, uh, don't go outside, stay inside where it's air conditioned, uh, keep yourself safe, stay hydrated, drink lots of water. Uh, but uh, while you're doing that, don't forget to get some electrolytes as well, because those are very important. And, and for those that are experiencing these issues, what are some of the common re reasons behind them experiencing these? And what are ways that you suggest and other emergency services workers suggest for them to prevent these issues going forward. Are you referring to the heat related yes. issues? Yes. Uh, obviously, like I just said, um, stay, uh, stay indoors unless you need to go outside and venture out. 
Um, and, and if you do need to go outside and do work, for example, you need to cut your grass, do some lawn work, yard work, things like that, do it in shifts uh, where you're outside for maybe 20 minutes or a half hour at a time and then go inside, take some time to cool off, uh, drink lots of water, uh, mix that up with Gatorade. Uh, or something similar so that you get some electrolytes because as you sweat, you're losing electrolytes as well. So simply drinking a lot of water is uh, gonna put yourself into a, a position where you may not have enough electrolytes to maintain cardiac function, muscular function. So you'll start cramping up. You might have some arrhythmias, things like that. So electrolytes are very important as well, uh, but maintain hydration, get some electrolytes, and then maybe go in shifts to uh, So that, that way you can still do the work that's necessary outside, but at the same time, you're not putting yourself as, as much of a risk. Can wearing a mask contribute to some of those issues? Yeah, I would say it probably does because if you think about the body's cooling system, uh, you sweat mostly uh, most of the time, and that's how you get rid of excessive heat. But uh, when you exhale, uh, that air that's coming out is at your body temperature. So your normal body temperature is 98.7. So if that mask is on your face, it will kind of recirculate. So then you're breathing back in 98.7 degree air because uh, they're kind of preheating it, if you will, in that and combined space. So that's going to reduce the body's ability to cool itself to a certain degree. Vince Warrior is with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the executive director of, a, of Alliance Mobile Health, uh, providing EMS services to multiple municipalities in our local in our local area. Um, so, Vince, going forward, what do you see as continuing to be some of those common health issues uh, as we continue through the summer that we see normally and are going to see maybe more of during the coronavirus pandemic and as we transition later on into the fall? Well, I think that the, the coronavirus pandemic is going to be here for quite some time. Uh, if you look at some of the models are predicting spikes in numbers coming in the fall. Uh, and I think that most of that is going to be as a result of us trying to get back to some level of normal uh, as far as society goes, opening up businesses and uh, allowing people to get back together, see each other again. So that's that's going to be expected, I guess. Uh, so the models I would expect are going to be somewhat accurate, but it'll be interesting to find out how close the numbers actually are going to be. Uh, as far as other things go, uh, yeah, as people venture outside and they do more things, we always have the, the seasonal bee stings and there's more trauma in the summertime because people are out, they're more active, things happen. Uh, there's more construction projects going on. People fall off roofs, off ladders, or you know, get injured in those processes as well. So we typically see a little bit more trauma in the summertime as a result of the increased activity of people outside. In, in addition to that, uh, there's always going hand in hand the heat-related issues, which we spoke about already. So if we practice some of those uh, uh, techniques of you know using uh, short durations outside with frequent cooling and hydration that will help prevent some of that but um, just be aware of your surroundings know what's going on around you be careful while you're out there having fun uh, jet ski accidents drownings uh, swimming accidents things like that are also on the rise in the summertime because uh, water's warmer the weather's nice people are outside doing more activities so um, recommendation is just be careful be safe and uh, but try to have some fun I, I think we've been cooped up long enough. Uh, everybody's a little anxious to get outside. So as you do venture outside, uh, just be cautious, be careful, and uh, uh, use good judgment. Vince Warrior with us, the executive director of Alliance Mobile Health. Before we let you go, just a couple more minutes with you. Anything else you'd like to touch on today? Um, I think that... Uh, Everybody's doing a really good job for the most part. I think that overall, I think that there's a little bit of um, resistance now with wearing masks. But uh, like we discussed before, the models are predicting that we are going to get a spike. Uh, what I would encourage people to do is just be mindful of that. And anytime you're in a public area, uh, be mindful of wearing a mask, not just to protect you, but to protect everybody around you from you, because uh, we've had several cases of people that are positive for COVID-19 that don't have any symptoms whatsoever. So even though you feel good and you don't have any symptoms, that doesn't mean you're not contagious. It doesn't mean you're not uh, a carrier, if you will. So just be mindful of that so that you don't spread the disease unwillingly. 
uh, to other individuals. Uh, the susceptible population is anybody that has comorbidities, things like uh, COPD, emphysema, uh, asthma, uh, heart conditions, congestive heart failure, things like that, or a compromised immune system. And, uh, you know, those people are going to have a much, much harder time overcoming the, the virus than a, a normal healthy person would. So uh, just be mindful of that. I know it's inconvenient, but it, it is something that we need to do to try and flatten that curve out so that we don't uh, spread the virus unknowingly. Well, Vince, thank, thank you very much for being with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Vince Warrias, the executive director of Alliance Mobile Health, with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back. We have Erica Jones out in the field. We'll check in with her, go through some of the latest headlines, and that will wrap up our show today. We'll be back in just a minute. Ronnie and I on the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the public information officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the Medical Director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Technology, like smartphones, are wonderful devices to reduce social isolation in older adults. You can call grandchildren, phone friends, participate in fitness classes, and play games. But you need to stay mindful of scams. Scams related to the COVID-19 virus are rising. These include attempts to obtain personal information from seniors, including pitching unreliable products, advice, tests, and cures. You need to stay vigilant and be cautious. If you feel that you have been taken advantage of, it's okay for you to reach out to somebody you know and seek out advice, or even contact your medical provider. Thank you. Back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. Also today, as always, on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. On 88.1 WBFH, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Today, our Facebook partner is the West Bloomfield School District. We are broadcasting live on their page. and welcome everybody tuning in through that medium. I encourage you to give the West Bloomfield School District a like on Facebook. And while you're there, go ahead and give us a like as well. We have Erica Jones out in the field. It looks like you are at one of those testing sites. Erica, is that correct? Yeah, hey Tyler, I'm at the Oakland County Health Division building in Southfield where they are doing drive through testing today. They have it here every Monday and Wednesday and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they have a drive-up drive testing location 
in Pontiac and then starting July 10th. So two days from now on Friday, they're starting a location on Fridays specifically in Farmington Hills. So that's going to be three different locations throughout the different days of the week where Oakland County is having free drive up testing. Um, unfortunately, we've been asked not to talk to anyone specifically or show any, you know, cars for privacy reasons because not everyone wants people to know they're getting tested or you know just confidentiality um but as you can see it's in the parking lot of the oakland county health division building so they have the tent set up here um and i will show you you if i can flip my camera and there we go yeah so you just drive up here you go into one of the tents and it's super quick and easy they test you and you're right out of here so they have all these cones set up it's definitely a very nice setup in the parking lot quick and easy in and out and again i said i'm in southfield right now where they have testing on mondays and wednesdays pontiac on tuesdays and thursdays starting this friday it'll be every friday in farmington hills so lots of locations for people in our area and it's super easy to come and get tested you actually do have to make an appointment you can go to oakdub.com under their coronavirus page and then drive up testing to do so and the only requirement is that you do need to be 18 years or older in order to sign up for testing. Any indication, Erica, from your conversations with officials at Oakland County and on site, if people are able to go back for testing, maybe they're tested for coronavirus, uh, for COVID-19 at the beginning of May or in mid-June, and then you know six weeks later, they're curious, I've been out in the community here and there again and again maybe i was exposed to it in those six weeks can you go back and get multiple tests do you know you know to be honest i have not heard an answer on that directly but i have no reason to believe that you aren't able i haven't heard or seen anything on the website specifically that says you can't and i would think you can get tested again because like you said you know within six weeks you very easily could be exposed to the virus again so i don't think there's any reason why you wouldn't be able to be tested again and as we know, we are having more supplies and increased testing as is, so you should be able to. But I don't, don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure, but I would think so, and I have not realized. Erica, anything else from you out there at the testing site in Southfield? No, it's just it's going well. There are, you know, right now there aren't as many cars, just a couple, um, you know, driving away. You can see there's a car. I don't know if you can see, but in that town right there, there's a yes. car. But when I first pulled up about 20 minutes ago, there was a long line. So I definitely think people are taking advantage of this resource, which is good. Everyone should at least come by and get tested at some point in time. It definitely still an essential resource. Erica, thank you very much for that report. Thank you. Erica Jones out in the field with us at the Southfield testing site. Interesting to hear from her that there still is an influx of people coming in. There is, a, and there was a line there when she did arrive. As as people are still very eager to get tested and and maybe even get tested regularly for the coronavirus, if that's possible. We don't have an indication of that. One thing I will say before you go, or as you're making your appointment, be sure to go on to the Oakland County website. They had some things on there I found interesting. Number one is obviously don't forget your ID. You know, uh, when you go there, you will be required to have your ID. You cannot have your pet with you in your car. So I, I thought that was surprising because a lot of people are taking their pets everywhere with them right now. But if your pet is in your car with you, they will not administer the test. So there are some things that you need to know before you go and you can find that information on the Oakland County website. So you don't wanna get there and get turned away. So no. do a little bit of research before you get out there. But as you're making your appointment, then you can read the, what you need to do before you get out there. And all that information can be found on our website on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. If you're watching on, on TV or on the Facebook page via Facebook Live on the West Bloomfield School District's Facebook page today, we have links on the coronavirus page on top of our headlines to reputable national, state, and local resources, including the Oakland County website, which will take you directly to their COVID-19 specific information page. It has uh, a number you can call for COVID-19 help, help information, an email hotline, and you can even text message about testing uh, and other COVID-19 information to OakGov at 28748. If you text OakGov to 28748, you can get more information on COVID-19 
from Oakland County directly and find more information on drive through testing like we like we got information from Erica Jones today it will provide locations and information on appointment times uh, for these various various locations on certain dates it'll tell you who qualifies for these tests and and give you resources for calling for making an appointment which you can do at two, at 1-800-848-5533 again for testing information and to make an appointment 1-800 Eight four eight five five three three, as well as information on what you need to have with you on the day of the appointment, what you can expect, and if you have an appointment, you need what you need to do before you go there, and what you can expect on site, as well as when you can respect. Uh, expect the results which is about three to five days and we talked about this previously in the city of Pontiac the faith-based on-site testing uh, is still currently available at multiple churches and places of faith in the city of Pontiac that's a direct partnership between the city of Pontiac and Oakland County directly so tons of information on the Oak Gov website on Oak Gov's uh, Oakland County's website about COVID-19 and that resource of course can be found on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Even beyond the testing, you're able to find more information on coronavirus as it pertains to Oakland County, which is really important for those living in the local area. One of the good things about having all this information at your fingertips is it changes so often. We have all been confused because it seems like every day something new or something has changed. So this is a good way to keep up with all the information that you need to know to keep yourself and your family safe during this time. And of course, all that information can be found online, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. You don't have to peruse through these websites directly to get to the information you need to know. You can go to our website, click on the state of Michigan's link. It's taking you to the michigan.gov coronavirus page directly. You click on the Oakland County page, it takes you directly to Oakland County's COVID-19 resources page. You click on the Centers for Disease Control Resources, it takes you to their COVID-19 page. So you don't have to look through and do a lot of searching just go to our website civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus you'll find links to the centers for disease control the state of michigan and oakland county's coronavirus covid 19 informational pages as well as direct links to your local municipalities which may have more information on coronavirus response or programs that are available as well as other information that you need to know from your local municipality so that you can stay informed about what's going on in your community including some additional headlines today governor whitmer says she could quote dial back reopening if covid 19 cases continue to rise governor gretchen whitmer in an interview with cnn on tuesday said the state could dial back the reopening if the covid 19 cases continue on its rising trend. The governor said, quote, if they keep moving up, we are going to dial back if we have to. That's the last thing any of us wants to do, and closed quote. Whitmer also recently ordered indoor services at bars to close. Uh, of course, bars, a heavy location for a couple of those major outbreaks of COVID-19 in the last couple of weeks in the state of Michigan. The Michigan Safe Start Plan is currently in phase four for the majority of the state with northern Michigan and, and the northern lower peninsula such as Traverse City currently in phase five. The governor says she will not be, quote, bullied into moving into the next phase before it is safe to do so. Lastly, again, today's reported 454 new cases from Tuesday of the coronavirus in the state of Michigan. Past the sobering mark also of 6,000 deaths. The state reported those 454 new cases and 30 additional deaths yesterday. 20 of those 30 deaths were from uh, records review. So those are not new deaths. Those are deaths that were not on the record previously. Only 10 of those deaths that were recorded out of the 30 from Tuesday are new deaths. Total number of Michigan residents who now have COVID-19 or have had COVID-19 is at 66,627 with a total of 6,005 total deaths. So COVID-19 still very much looming over our community and over the state of Michigan. What was previously in the green and looking like we were trending up to uh, prevent a second wave of coronavirus. We're now at a much higher risk, as reports are showing, for a second outbreak. So vigilance and care is still absolutely critical for the people of the state of Michigan and, frankly, for our future to make sure that if you want to move into phase five and have further restrictions be lifted, 
and have more industries open and support your local businesses and support your students and your schools and your teachers. Wear your mask, keep your social distance, wash your hands, sanitize often, do your part so that we can get out of this as soon as we possibly can. That is going to do it for our show today. We thank our guests, including Dr. Laura Lamb from the Beaumont Research Institute, David Lorenz, the Vice President of Travel Michigan with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, Deanna Barish, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction at the West Bloomfield School District, and Vince Warius, the Executive Director of Alliance Mobile Health, for joining us. In addition, we thank our team, our producer Jeff, and our co-producers Larry Nyland, Ryan Younglove, Jake Kustash, and more, and our Facebook partner today, the West Bloomfield School District. In addition to all of our family of TV and radio stations, that will do it for today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Ronnie and I will return tomorrow.